This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 921, recorded on July 21st, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. COVID, monkeypox, poliovirus. Yeah, you know, Vincent, this has really just transformed into the weekly TWIV clinical update. So we'll, we'll make sure we touch on everything. And my quotation, I think you will get, when angry, <laughs> count 10 before you speak. If very angry, 100, Thomas <laughs> Jefferson. Um I think as we get to number two on my list today, Vincent will be uh, counting well past 100 because this is something that we've been talking about and and now there's a tragedy. So uh, just our update and we're going to be mostly talking about COVID, but COVID deaths are back up to above 400 deaths per day per the New York Times tracker. So that's that's about 3,000 a week. That's 150,000 per year at this rate. So, um, you know, I, I will point out um, that a surprise, this is surprising to me, but as surprising as this seems, the majority of the people being hospitalized are still the unvaccinated. I, I mean, where are we getting these people? Where, where are they? Um, shocking that there are still so many unvaccinated people out there. Right here in New York, a heavily vaccinated region, the majority of admissions are still among the unvaccinated. Um, the math with 10 times the rate of hospitalization for the unvaccinated means that until we get greater than 90% vaccinated, we're not gonna see that turnaround. It's still gonna be that, that math. Um, and let's get to the part where um, Vincent needs to count way past 100. Um, and this, this is really tragic. Um, a case of paralytic poliomyelitis was recently identified in an individual right here, um, Rockland County, New York. Um, the CDC is consulting with the New York State Department of Health on this investigation. Um, sequencing performed by the Wadsworth um, Lab, uh, New York State DOH's public health lab, and confirmed by the CDC shows that this was revertent polio Sabin type 2 virus. So this is indicative of a transmission from an individual who received the oral polio virus, OPV, which is no longer authorized or administered in the U.S., um, where only the inactivated polio, IPV, has been given since 2000. Um, so this suggests that this virus may have originated, did originate, in a location outside of the U.S. where OPV is administered. Um, Vincent, you, you've, been, you've been saying for quite a while now um, that we need surveillance, that we really need to continue to vaccinate our kids because of this concern. Um, are you just banging your head against the wall? Actually, I'm pretty calm, uh, Daniel, <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. um, you know, I, yes, we have been saying for a while that we should be looking in the sewers because as you saw recently in the UK, they found polio in the sewers, poliovirus RNA, and they do routine surveillance. And the use of oral polio vaccine is accompanied by uh, extensive circulation among people without polio. You can find it in the sewage. And then if vaccination coverage isn't complete, then there are vulnerable people. And this individual was not vaccinated. So the thing is, it's a simple solution. Just get vaccinated. There's nothing tricky about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's tough because, you know, there there is this movement, as we're now seeing, where where a choice is made. Oh, there's not much polio. Why am I still like subjecting my child to this this vaccination? This is why this is why. So this this child's paralyzed. Um, you know, you, you can't go back. You can't you can't now give the vaccine. Um, it, really, really tragic. Um, next on our docket is the monkeypox. Um, we're now up to over 2000 diagnosed cases of monkeypox um, here in the U.S. Um, about half of those are right here in the New York area. Um, there's a couple of reasons. One is we're actually testing. Uh, we'll leave uh, some links in the show notes to the monkeypox tracker, the New York City monkeypox data. Um, but just 
to mention um, the the testing um, has really, I think, as I mentioned last time, um, we now can just go ahead and test um, if we want to. Um, but to save myself a lot of calls and texts, um, well, I don't know how many I'll say, but I'm going to get this out here. How do you go ahead and approach a patient that you are concerned might have the monkeypox? So the first thing we have to do is we've got to move past the circular reasoning. Um, if we're only testing a certain population, we're only going to see it in that certain population. Um, we just had a call this morning at Columbia where we were looking over, um, Jason Zucker was leading the call, um, looking over the, the individuals that um, we've so far treated at Columbia, um, and over 40 so far have had access to the T-pox. We'll maybe mention a little bit about that. Um, but the one patient that was outside that population was the one patient that I had tested and actually was positive. So um, if you don't test women, if you don't test married men, you're not going to get a positive test result in those individuals. So a person comes in, have a high index of suspicion. Um, don't be thinking we're having a sudden wave of folliculitis. Um, we are having a wave of the monkeypox. Uh, we're doubling the number of diagnoses per week. Um, you want to get in there and you want to swab those lesions vigorously. Um, send off your HSV, VZV, PCR. Um, that is a swab. And if we're doing LabCorp, that's code 139367. Um, you're going to send that in your universal transport median. But you want to also send off the monkeypox. I want to point out Hickam was right. Lots of co-infections here. The monkeypox, this is the um, orthopox virus DNA, right? DNA. This is a PCR. You're going to use a non-cotton swab. It's uh, LabCorp code 140230. Two swabs, um, you're going to send those off in sterile containers. And I do want to point out, um, in you know, as Hickam, we'll get to him again, um, we are seeing lots of co-infections. So look for other sexually transmitted infections. Um, test for HIV, test for syphilis. Consider sending off that urine. And actually, we say three location testing for the GC, chlamydia, and uh, trichomonas, trichomoniasis. Um, but again, use your judgment. Um, but to reinforce, we are seeing lots of co-infections. We went through that this morning. Hickam was right again. A patient can have as many diseases as they damn well please. Um, I can't believe we didn't learn this lesson. I remember the early days of COVID. Unless they had a ticket from Wuhan, you couldn't test them. If they had something else, they couldn't have COVID at the same time. Here, we repeated the same issue again. While the CDC was rationing tests, if you got a positive herpes, if you found some other disease, you could not go ahead and get that monkeypox. Where do people get this idea that you can only have one thing at a time? Um, and reminder on transmission, monkeypox spreads in uh, several different ways. Um, this can spread from person to person, direct contact with infectious rash scabs or body fluids, respiratory secretions during prolonged face-to-face -face contact or during intimate physical contact, such as kissing, sex, or cuddling. You can even get this cuddling. Um, touching items, such as clothing or linens that have previously touched the infectious rash or body fluids. Pregnant people can transmit the virus to their fetus through placenta. I anticipate that this will be like the early days of COVID. We'll start getting all these um, PCR studies on, um, on viral material on all these areas, but let's not repeat the same mistakes. We don't just want PCR. We want, shall I say, plaque assays, Vincent? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I will point, it is also possible for people to get monkeypox from infected animals, either being a uh, bitten, scratched, preparing their meat, etc. We had an individual this morning who actually got bit on the ear and that was where the monkeypox appeared. That was the end of the contact because this gentleman did not enjoy that being bitten on the ear. Um, but here's what's going to kill us. Um, right now we're struggling to tell people with COVID that they have to isolate for five days and continue to use precautions for another five because a lot of folks are still contagious. But with the monkeypox, you may continue to transmit for up to four weeks. Uh, the CDC is saying no sex, abstain from that close intimate contact for four weeks. Uh, other recommendations are out to eight. All right. Well, you and will learn Daniel, more. at least you can go outside. You don't have to stay home, right? 
yes, you can go out, you can do these things. Just no, no, no cuddling, no cuddling for uh, yeah. or okay. other intimate activities. All right, children and COVID, getting back into the COVID realm. Um, remember, those vaccines are out there. You want to really get on board. Get those vaccines in time for the start of the school in the fall. Um, I would love if our kids could go back to school without mask mandates. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about a gentleman who recently got infected and has the benefit of vaccine protecting them. So the vaccines are great. Um, testing. Remember, use those tests intelligently. Remember, there's more out there, not just COVID, and you can have COVID and other things at the same time. All right, we'll talk about active vaccination. And, and don't worry, we'll, we'll mention uh, President Biden at the end. Um, Amy sent me the preprint, SARS-CoV-2 variant vaccine boosters trial preliminary analysis. Um, these are the results of a phase two open label randomized trial that enrolled healthy adults previously vaccinated with a SARS-CoV-2 primary series and a single boost. Eligible participants were randomized to one of six arms, um, and these were Moderna COVID-19 mRNA vaccine arms, uh, the prototype mRNA-1273, that's the original, um, the Omicron BA-1 plus a beta one dose, the Omicron BA-1 plus a beta with two doses, the Omicron BA-1 plus Delta, Omicron BA-1 monovalent, and an Omicron BA-1 plus prototype. Uh, they went ahead and neutralization antibody titers, the ID50, were assessed for the ancestral, so the D614G, Delta, Beta, and Omicron BA1 variants, and Omicron BA.2.12.1, and BA.4 and BA.5 subvariants 15 days after vaccination. Um, so can you guess what are we going to measure 15 days after vaccination? Um, they are going to look at the gene geometric mean titers against um, all these different ones. So they're going to look at D614G with similar across arms and ages and higher with prior infection. For uninfected participants, day 15, Omicron BA1, GMTs were similar across Omicron containing vaccine arms, um, sort of in the 3724 to 4561 and higher than prototype, which was about 2000. I will mention that a subset of samples from uninfected participants in forearms were also tested in a different lab at day 15 for neutralizing antibody titers for um, all these different variants. Um, I will mention um, that they're approximately one third of the BA1 for the BA4 and the BA5. Higher BA1 titers were observed with the Omicron container vaccines compared to prototype vaccine. Um, and the titers, again, against BA4 and BA5 were lower than against BA1 for all candidate vaccines. All right. Um, I sort of like having this data in front of me when I talk about the preprint Novavax NVX COVID 2373 triggers potent neutralization of Omicron sublineages. Well, uh, I like that title. It's a little bit leading. So let's see what the preprint suggests. Well, here what we find is that after two doses, Omicron sublineage BA1 and BA4 were res resistant to neutralization by 72% and 59% of samples. However, after a third dose of the Novavax, they observed high titers against Omicron BA1 and BA4. But what were those high titers? Remember those numbers from up above? The GMT for BA1 was 1197, and against BA4, it was 582. What to make of those? I'm not sure. I will mention that Novavax has a contract in place to produce its own Omicron-specific boosters. So expect more data from them on boosting with an Omicron-specific Novavax. And on Novavax, the CDC recommends Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine for adults. So number four, on Tuesday, 7, 1922, the CDC Director Raquel P. Walensky endorsed the CDC ACIP 
practices recommendation that Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine be used as another primary series option for adults ages 18 and older. Um, and then I was a little bit disturbed. Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine will be available in the coming weeks. Not now, not tomorrow, but in weeks. So still waiting on that. And I have a list of patients. So every time there's something about Novavax in the news, is it here? Can I get it? Is it here? Can I get it? Um, still weeks away. Daniel, I understand that Europe has plenty of doses, but we don't because they got them initially. So now they have to produce it for the U.S. Yeah. And part of the holdup was this manufacturing issue, um, which which is, you know, I don't want to downplay that. You want to make sure the product you get are up to the manufacturing standards of the FDA. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're kind of done waiting. And it is true. I am optimistic. There are millions of folks who um, we hear are just waiting for this vaccine and then they'll get vaccinated. So that would that would be nice. That would be nice. So we'll we'll continue with that optimism. Remember our passive vaccination, Ebu Sheld. Um, I did get some communications from my rheumatology colleagues about uh, the low dose methotrexate. Um, you know, I still maybe I'm a little more pro Ebu Sheld than everyone out there. Um, but remember, this is sitting on shelves. This is another therapeutic to consider um, in those folks with moderate to severe immune compromise or those folks that can't um, get vaccinated. All right. And now we move into the early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase, that first week of illness when people have mild or moderate non-hypoxic COVID. Um, and we just heard about a famous individual today who got diagnosed this morning. I don't know um, when this drops. It'll be two days. It'll be old news. But Vincent, I don't know if you've been following the uh, the news on Biden. Mm -hmm. I did hear that. Yes. And so a 79 year old individual. That uh, Daniel's going to prescribe Paxlovid, right? <laughs> he has. Well, shouldn't we wait to see? Shouldn't we wait and see if he progresses? Shouldn't we give him know. four or five days so the efficacy of Paxlovid is is less and he has a chance to develop an immune response, Vincent? That's a good way to put it. No, he's he's in his 80s. We should not wait. Yeah. Right. This is and he's and and that was what I thought was nice. And in all the coverage, it was. This is a gentleman who's been vaccinated, so 90% reduction in progression. He was started on the Paxlovid. No one's given him bad advice about waiting because we do know that you wait, and we'll get to some data on that coming right up here. He is vaccinated. He's on the Paxlovid, 99% reduction in his risk of progression. Here's an individual with less than a 1% chance of progressing to severe or critical COVID. So I expect things to go quite well there. Um, all right. So number one, just like the president, you can get Paxlovid if you are eligible, if you have high risk features. And the correspondence published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, Paxlovid in patients who are immunocompromised and hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2 infection reinforces that those folks recommending waiting to let the immune response respond are not giving good advice. Um, we saw that therapy in the first three days gave us an 89% reduction, then drops to 88% out to day five. But what about waiting until folks end up in the hospital? In this report, they found that no vaccination delayed Paxlovid treatment greater than five days after diagnosis and immunocompromised condition were independent predictors for prolonged viral elimination. There were 35 patients who were immune compromised in this cohort, including three recipients of solid organ transplants, seven with autoimmune rheumatic conditions, three with hematological malignancies, and 22 with malignant solid tumors. They found that Paxlovid prescriptions within five days of diagnosis had a faster clearance of viral load as measured by viral gene replication and a shorter time to viral elimination in patients who are immune compromised. And they're giving us numbers of 13.67 days versus is 19.17 days. Um, so the correlation between timing of Paxlovid initiation and viral elimination was linear in the study. So just remember, first three days, 89% reduction. You get it on day four and five, 88% reduction, so still pretty good. You wait past five days and you're starting to see drop in efficacy. So the science does not support waiting and seeing. All right, number two, remdesivir. We have the 
early three-day treatment data, about 87% reduction in progression, so not a bad next choice for those folks with drug-drug interactions. And we heard um, the president actually, for a period of time, will be stopping his direct oral anticoagulant and his statin therapy, which is what we recommend. That's an easy way to approach it. Number three, bebtilovimab monoclonal therapy. Um, this is number three. Um, and as I mentioned, we have limited direct efficacy data here, but number four, malnupiravir, last and least with only about a 30% reduction in progression. Um, and remember, no steroids, no antibiotics, no ivermectin, no fluvoxamine, no colchicine, no zinc, no high-dose vitamin C. Remember, there are impacts in terms of opportunity costs. Um, I had a lady recently, I was taking care of the husband. Um, the lady was out there in the community. Um, she was getting a bad advice. She was following a COVID protocol that involved some of the components in the above list. Um, and I, I really wanted to remind people of the nocebo effect. I don't know if people are familiar with the nocebo, um, but a lot of this communication, if you suggest to someone that something will do harm, and we're hearing a lot of negative press about effective things, then you may end up. So remember, the nocebo is the placebo's evil twin. All right, we do have an update to the living WHO guidelines on drugs for COVID-19. This was published in the BMJ, but it is behind a paywall. So the latest version of the WHO living guideline provides two new recommendations for patients with non-severe COVID-19. A, a recommendation against the, loose, the use of fluvoxamine except in the context of a clinical trial and B, a strong recommendation against the use of colchicine. All right, um, more results from the ACTIVE-6 trial, inhaled fluticasone for outpatient treatment of COVID-19, a decentralized placebo-controlled randomized platform clinical trial. We have this data as a preprint. Um, and this is this whole concept of repurposed drugs, uh, which was very exciting. Um, you know, the idea that maybe heartburn medicine or my horse, horse's chocolate flavored deworming paste had the magical ability to cure COVID if we just wash it down with a little bleach and a few flashlights. Well, non-hospitalized adults aged greater than or equal to 30 experiencing greater or equal to two symptoms of acute COVID for less than seven days were randomized to inhaled fluticasone. Um, this is a steroid inhaler, 200 micrograms once daily for 14 days or placebo. Uh, so this is using an inhaled steroid. The primary outcome was time to sustained recovery defined as the third of three consecutive days without symptoms. So I think this is interesting. We're looking at people feeling better. Um, secondary outcomes included composites of hospitalization or death with or without urgent care or emergency department visits by day 28. Now, what did they find of those eligible for the fluticasone arm? 656 were randomized to and received inhaled fluticasone. 621 received concurrent placebo. There was no evidence in improvement to recovery with fluticasone compared with placebo. Uh, three participants in each arm were hospitalized. No deaths occurred. Um, adverse events were uncommon in both arms. So in this study, it appeared that treatment with inhaled fluticasone, inhaled steroids for 14 days, did not result in improved time to recovery um, among patients with COVID-19 in the U.S. And I do want to point out, I presented this data, and one of the questions right away was, well, it doesn't seem like it does any harm, so maybe if I have a patient, I can give it to them, and it will help them feel better. Better. This was a study asking, will this help them feel better? And what did they find? No. So don't do it. All right. Keep your hands in your pockets. And remember, isolated for the infected. I keep reinforcing this, and I'm very interested to see what happens six days from now. The first five days, isolation for the infected. That's when the people are the most contagious. This is not a great time for those photo shoots to show someone smiling and happy and healthy. Um, this is when the person is most infectious. The first five days, 85% of the transmission occurs. Day six through 10, the current CDC recommendations is you can be out and about, but you should wear a proper fitting mask because there may be continued transmission past then. So day six through 10. Um, so a lot of people seem to think day six, off with the mask, I'm done. We'll see what happens. All right, that second week, 
Um, people seem to forget that first week is that viral symptom phase, the non-hypoxic, mild to moderate. The second week is the early inflammatory, lower respiratory hypoxic phase. With vaccines, with early treatment, hopefully people are avoiding the hypoxic component there. This is when you consider things like steroids, anticoagulation, uh, pulmonary support, maybe remdesivir, um, et cetera. But this is not necessarily a treatment rebound. We've been seeing this for two years. People have a week of viral illness, and then just like Ian Lipkin that second week, then they get the COVID. Um, that is part of the natural history. Um, we want to keep our eye on the long COVID that we're still seeing. Um, there's going to be a lot coming out in the press because a lot of people are getting frustrated. Um, where's that money? Where's all these evidence-based therapies? So let's continue to work with those folks. And as I like to close every time, no one is safe until everyone is safe. We have a lot of folks out there in the world without access to vaccines, without the education that makes them excited to get those vaccines. So. Right now is when I want everyone to pause, pull over, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com. Um, we're getting right to the end of our Foundation International Medical Release of Children um, fundraiser. So during the months May, June, and July, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled up to a potential donation of $40,000 uh, for Fimrix Clinic there in Beduda. If we can really get a good push here in this last week of July, I'm going to encourage the directors to maybe be even a little more generous if you can help us do that. Time for your questions for Daniel. Send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Carrie writes, I'm a 42-year-old pregnant woman, no health conditions other than celiac disease, food allergies, and mild asthma during wildfire season. I'm due October 8th. I've been vaccinated three times with Moderna. Last dose almost one year ago. You mentioned a few weeks ago that Paxlovid would be an important consideration for pregnant women who test positive even with no other high-risk conditions. Because our oldest will be starting kindergarten this August, our exposure level is about to skyrocket. I asked my OB about my risk in Paxlovid. He seemed to be unconcerned, confirmed I was vaccinated and boosted and said, quote, you will probably be fine, unquote. Yeah. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad someone put the quotes around the probably. Um, so this, this is the issue, and we keep coming back to this, is – Women who are pregnant, pregnant individuals, um, they are at high risk. Uh, they're at high risk of ending up in the hospital. Uh, we've seen double the risk of losing the baby during the pregnancy if a woman gets infected with COVID. Um, there's even been some impacts on um, looking at children who are born to women who have COVID. Uh, sort of interesting, the timing there on what trimester puts the highest risk. So, so a pregnant individual is at high risk. So there's someone that we definitely want to consider treatment. If you look at the EUA for Paxlova, there's a section, I've been asked this question enough, I, I know which section, it's section 8.1, and it goes through all the data, right? So the nermotrelvir and the ritonavir, there's two components in Paxlova that we have um, concerns about. So the nermotrelvir, um, we have a lot of animal data, we've looked at that, there's no concerning signal, even giving doses much, much higher than we give to human beings. We now have a growing experience having treated women. Um, the big thing here is getting the COVID during the pregnancy is not good. It's associated with significant risks. We are not seeing concerns on the other side. Now, if you're not excited about Paxlovid, if you and your physician are uncomfortable, remdesivir is another option. And there also is monoclonals. I recently had a discussion um, and there was some hesitancy. The, the dad was a physician we went ahead with beptilovimab. So really the big thing is consider treatment. Don't just say, you'll probably be fine. Because then when you lose the baby, then when you have a bad outcome, um, you missed your opportunity to prevent that. So just to conclude, pregnancy does put her under high risk. She should be an, ad an advocate for Paxlovid or uh, remdesivir or monoclonals, correct? Yes, agreed. Not malnupiravir, but yes, would, right. would recommend treatment. All right. Genevieve writes, my father is 80, fully vaccinated, two boosters, uses the local VA hospital for his needs. He has not contracted COVID yet. I want to have a plan in place in case he does, but I'm having a hard time navigating the resources available from the VA. 
He is on lifelong Zarelto due to history of two DVTs, so he will not be a candidate for Paxlovid. Do you have any suggestions as to finding out what therapeutics are available at my local VA? We live in Oregon. Yeah, so that's a, that's an interesting, and, and I think maybe it's good that we've got sort of President Biden here in the picture. So the Xarelto is one of those direct oral anticoagulants. Um, you take it to prevent the recurrence of the of the DVT. There is an interaction with Paxlovid. So so what did uh, what did President Biden's um, physician advise? Advised stopping um, that medication for the five days. Um, and then restarting it after the five days. So is there really a high risk with stopping it for five days? You've got to weigh that risk versus the risk of not treating the COVID, not getting that 90% reduction. So that's that's one thing to consider with the physician. You want to have that plan in place. Can you just stop a medicine for five days, whether it's a statin or whether it's one of these oral acting anticoagulants? Um, then you move down, not a lot of access to remdesivir, unfortunately. Um, I think Vincent and I saw some of the data. It's like less than 1% of treatment is with IV remdesivir, just not well operationalized. Number three, you do have um, the monoclonals, bebtilovimab. Um, but again, you're going to need to get a sense of where can you access that. And number four, last and least, but still there, um, Malnupiravir is another option. This is something we feel comfortable with um, in individuals um, sort of as described. Um, you don't have to worry about the drug-drug interactions. Um, you don't have to worry about renal function. Um, so that's another consideration. So um, there are certain um, therapeutic locators uh, that you and your doctor could look at. This ArcGIS therapeutics locator for COVID, just Google COVID therapeutics, ArcGIS, A-R-C-G-I-S, um, and that can give you a sense of where the resources are in your area. And the last one from Bistra. We're trying to understand what's the protection of previous infections from getting infected and reinfected right now and the risk of complicated illness from repeat infections. I want to advise my elderly parents, 83 and 79, as they live in a country with poor pandemic response. They have two AstraZeneca doses, one Pfizer booster, just recovered from COVID with somewhat mild illness without the need for hospitalization. What's the next steps for them? Continuing to mask, even though no one masks where they are. Do they need physiotherapy appointments? Do, do they, they want to see, they need physiotherapy appointments. Sorry, they want to see friends. They need some socializing. Uh, how, how much should they avoid that? Should they get a fourth booster? In general, what does natural immunity coupled uh, with vaccination uh, do for us? So I think that the overall question, Daniel, is, how well protected are you in that age group with both vaccine doses and natural infection? Yeah, and, and I think that this will echo back to, you know, it's great that we have a 79-year-old gentleman who just got infected that we can keep reinforcing. And, and hopefully, Vincent and I, we've done a good job of reinforcing this. The vaccines continue um, to provide about a 90% reduction in your risk of severe disease. You know, when you when you really get the data, when you remove out the immunocompromise and you really look at the numbers, um, we're seeing uh, they continue to endure. You know, with Omicron, we really sort of moved to, you need that third shot. Um, in particularly people who are advanced age, immunocompromised, okay, we're seeing data on the fourth shot. Um, but then the big thing is is also looking at, can I even get that lower with access to therapeutics? Um, but this doesn't do away with the um, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Make, make smart choices. Um, and I think maybe as a society, it makes sense for us to make smart choices. If you're going to be giving a, an 84-year-old woman an award for something, do you really need to have that in an indoor crowded setting? Can't we have that outdoors with good ventilation? Let's let's just start thinking about things. Um, you know, we lose a lot of people to restaurants pathogens to flu, to COVID, to all these other things. Uh, maybe we as a society and we as individuals can find some sort of common ground for things to be a little bit more reasonable because we do. We can't continue to be socially isolated. I'm not sure I need to shake people's hands, um, but I think we do need that social interaction. We need to figure out a way to, to do that um, intelligently um, and with a reasonable risk ratio. I keep going back to your original statement last week and echoed this week, most of the people dying are either unvaccinated, immunosuppressed, or over 75. And we could save most of them with Paxlovid, remdesivir, monoclonals given early. Yeah. I, so I, yeah. I, 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 yeah. So with that, you can 
move forward and take care of this vulnerable population. Right? You, you really, you really can. The majority of deaths that we are seeing are avoidable. And we could drop that 90% with vaccinations. We could drop that another 90% with early treatment. We can drop in certain populations another 85% with Ebuchelt. I mean, we have the tools. We just have to do them. That's why there's a opinion in the New York Times saying, oh, the endemic COVID looks very grim. But they failed to note that you could prevent most of these deaths even if we don't know why the vulnerable population is so vulnerable, we can still prevent them. Yeah, so you're, not, you're not going to gonna get as many readers, Vincent, if you just tell the truth. You need to be dramatic. But I think we're moving past that. Don't worry. <laughs> if you, if you want to get interviewed, talk to people about the monkeypox. We, we really <laughs> – we need to stop being Or so, polio. Yeah, or polio, <laughs> yes. Or Paracovirus. That was in the Times this week as well. Yeah, you know, um, we I think we discussed that um, on um, on the ID Puscast, the Infectious Disease Puscast. So if people want to mm -hmm. hear about Paracovirus um, and and the recent report, whether or not there's something to worry about or not, please tune into the ID Puscast. That's COVID nineteen clinical update number one hundred and twenty four with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you, and everyone, be safe.